So you know that feeling when you finish watching your favorite show's new season and it really doesn't end the way you wanted it to end and nothing you do can stop the ache in your heart that you now have. So you start lying to yourself that actually the entire season was a big lie made by the creator to fool you and everyone else and in the next season it will all be explained with a happy ending because none of the characters did anything wrong and it was all a misunderstanding and they can live happily ever after? No? Well the good omens fandom does and that's what we're going to talk about today. The conspiracy board is flipped. I did not realize that it was gonna be flipped on video. Okay, so this was completely fucking useless. Hi, welcome to my new video. But just a quick note, I really wanted to thank everyone for all the nice feedback on my last video. I really didn't expect that. My subscriber count went from 4 to 400. That's insane. So I'm really happy that you liked my content enough to stick around and subscribe. Today I wanted to talk about something that I'm currently very passionate about, and that's good omens theories. I made an entire board. So as we've talked about in the last video, the finale was something and people needed to find a way to cope. The most popular ways to cope in fandoms are usually by making fan art, writing or reading fan fiction, making meta-analysis on every single choice the character makes. That's me. I'm dead or by making theories. I'm usually not that much of a theory fan. That's actually the end of the sentence. I don't like theories. I usually take what I see at face value. If I don't see anything odd or sticking out while I'm watching, then I don't really see a reason why dig into it more. That's why I've accepted the finale for what it is. Everything seemed to fit. The characters weren't acting out of place, so I cried and moved on. But some people found clues hidden in the episode. Like for example, what was that look that Metatron gave Crowley? Why was that coffee so weirdly emphasized? Size. Did really 15 minutes pass while they were kissing? Does this all mean that the ending was not what it seemed to be? And that's where I come in to crush everyone's hopes and dreams. Because everyone seemed to like the part where I talk about the coffee theory in my last video and I also need to talk about everything Good Omens related or else I'll pop. I decided to make another video where I talk about more theories that I found and all the evidence and proof that people use to support them. But also my view on things and all of the reasons why I don't think they really work. A disclaimer before we start. Uh, if you believe in any of the theories that I talk about today, that's completely okay. You are free to do that. I think they're all fun. I was to read a fanfiction about every single one of them. I just can't see them happening in season 3. And to people that are like me and don't believe in them, don't be mean. <laughs> because obviously there will be discussion in the comments and I don't want it to be heated. Everyone please be nice to each other. Do also I may get some things wrong. I try my hardest to not do that, but it's possible that I did. If I don't perfectly represent your theory, then I'm really sorry. Uh, I tried my hardest, I did my research, but there are just so many versions of each theory out there that it's literally impossible to bring up every point and every evidence for each theory. Intro is over, let's jump into it. So I'm going to start this off with a short joke theory. I've only seen it on 28th of July, immediately after the season dropped, and it was born out of the misery that people felt after finishing the season. But I found it super hilarious, so I've decided to talk about it quickly in the beginning. So, does anyone remember Sherlock season 4? Bear with me, I am going somewhere with this and pay attention because it will be important later. In 2017, fourth and final season of BBC's popular TV show Sherlock dropped, a starring Benedict Cumberbatch, but you may also know him as Satan. You, you're my rebellious son. This is the third time I'm talking about Benedict Cumberbatch in a video, and I only have three videos. I think everyone here heard about Sherlock by now, but if you haven't, in short, it was another Sherlock Holmes adaptation and it went really popular on Tumblr because the two main characters had this weird homoerotic tension between them. These days we just call it queerbaiting. So people were obviously hoping that at the end of the show the characters would get together and live happily ever after. But what we've got instead was the worst season out of all of them, with the dumbest fucking plot that I've ever seen. And also, surprise surprise! Uh, no gay relationship. So yeah, everyone loved that, but some people were so in denial and so desperately wanted to clean John to the idea that Sherlock and John were in love, they made this entire conspiracy. Some of you already know where I'm going with this. In one episode, Sherlock said that people stop searching after the number three, because there is something weirdly comforting about the number three, so people never look for a fourth thing. And some fans took that as 
foreshadowing. So yes, the theory was that there is a fourth episode of Sherlock that would drop on this date where Sherlock would normally air, but now that Sherlock has finished, a new season was supposed to fill up the Sherlock time slot on BBC, and people thought that BBC made an entire show uh, just so they can hide that Sherlock has a fourth hidden episode. It was insane. But then the time has come and the episode sadly and obviously didn't air. If you want to hear more about the John Locke conspiracy, then uh, watch this video by Sarah Z. She did a great job and I absolutely loved it. Now you may think, wow, thank you for mansplaining the entirety of Sherlock to me. Uh, I really needed to hear that. Anyways, what does that have to do with anything? Well, history is a circle. When the new Good Omen season dropped, people were obviously unwell and unhappy, to the point that some fans started to discuss seventh episode. <laughs> because God likes the number seven. Most people were obviously joking, but I've seen some people actually take it seriously, so that's why I'm mentioning it here. It was mostly young fans and people that didn't know better, but it's still the funniest thing out of everything that I will talk about today. It was born out of the misery that season two brought. It's been 20 days since the series dropped uh, when I'm recording this, so I think it's safe to say that the seventh episode probably won't come out. I think everyone and their mother has heard about this theory by now. When I was writing my last video, I've seen most people agree with it. One time I've said in a Good Omens Discord that I don't like the coffee theory and I killed the entire chat. So yes, I left that server, I got so embarrassed. But now I feel like it has become more infamous. Like I see more people shit on it than agree with it lately. But that's only on Tumblr, on TikTok, it's still pretty liked. I'm not going to talk about it in detail. I've talked about it in my last video and I also think you've all heard it by now. So I'm going to shorten this for the sake of mine and your sanity. Basically, the coffee theory is about something being wrong with the coffee that Metatron gives Xerophel. Usually people believe that the almonds in the coffee serve as sort of a drug for Xerophel because almonds in the Bible say signify uh, divine favor and approval and the purity of the virgin. Uh, whatever that means. I don't know what that has to do with anything either. That's why Aziraphale is not acting on its own and is sort of possessed by the holiness and that's why he chooses heaven over Crowley. This is the first version that I've heard about but some people in the comments mentioned that cyanide kind of smells like almonds so he put cyanide in his coffee, and that the poison had the same effect on Xerophel as Lambdanum had on Crowley. But this is a common misconception that I've noticed in the fandom. People think that poison works as sort of a drug for angels and demons, and that it's because of that Crowley got high, and it works the same on Aziraphale when he drinks the coffee. But Crowley didn't get high because of poison, uh, he got high because laudanum is made out of alcohol and opium, and opium is used for making heroin. <laughs> Another evidence that people present to back this theory up is that you can see the coffee in the intro walking with the rest of the people, so that's why it has to be important. And I mean, I'm not saying that the coffee isn't important, it can be used to represent the coffee shop that is really important in the season, but it's also used as a manipulation tactic by Metatron. He's giving Aziraphale the coffee so that he trusts him. He's literally saying like, oh, take this coffee, young lad, I've drank shit before, you see, I'm not like the rest of these angels, look at these lame ass bitches, I'm just like you, you can believe me, because I also know the wonders of life, I'm different like that, I completely understand you, and you see, I may not be wrong as you think I am, I mean, no harm, I'm definitely not evil. So the coffee is super important, it's just not drugged, and then the mirror sound. First thing I wanted to apologize because I got it wrong in my last video. I said that I can't hear the miracle sound and that it should play when Aziraphale drinks the coffee, but apparently it plays when Metatron gives over the coffee to Aziraphale. So yes, I've listened to a wrong part of the clip for like 20 times. I love that. Good job, me. Anyways, I still don't think it can be used as proof for this theory because I think it's a car noise. When you replay that entire scene, even when Billy Bob and Gabriel are back in the bookshop, uh, there are lots of noises coming from outside of the bookshop. 
because it's located on a really busy street of Soho, there are lots of noises coming out from the street, so you can hear lots of sounds that are similar to that one. Hi, so I noticed something while editing. When Metatron enters the bookshop, there are these, uh, I don't know what it's called, and they make noise when somebody walks around them, uh, in this case it's Metatron. In the absence of Gabriel, I'm, Me, I'm sorry, I must interrupt you there. Nothing wrong. Well... So while recording the coffee scene, I think somebody from the crew walked around them and made the sound by accident and they just didn't take it out because it's literally the same sound. Okay, that's it. Bye bye. Thank God I can finally stop talking about the coffee theory and never talk about it again. <laughs> Lie theory. This theory kind of feels like coffee theory with extra steps. I saw it first on TikTok and then I talked about it with my friend and I found out that there are lots of versions of this theory. So if you believe in this theory but I said something differently then it's probably because I've heard different versions. So the gist of it is that when Metatron comes into the coffee shop he asks if anyone chooses death over coffee and then calls people predictable. And some people think that it's some kind of foreshadowing for what's about to happen. Metatron either threatens Aziraphale or implies it, or Aziraphale realizes on his own the weight of the situation, so he decides to go to heaven with Metatron because of it. At first I found it kind of stupid, because I think if Metatron actually threatened Aziraphale, Aziraphale wouldn't go out of spite and would tell Crowley immediately so that he can go save him later. But then I saw someone pointing out that Metatron could have threatened Aziraphale with harming Crowley. And yeah, that would make more sense, but I don't really see a reason why he would do that. Like, alright, you've got Aziraphale, what does that help you? He won't actually do shit in heaven because he's too pissed off. He still will try to contact Crowley so he can get him out of there. The entire point of Metatron separating them is that he doesn't want them to stop the Armageddon again. So if they'll just get back together in like a month and ruin it all over again, then why even bother? Also, Aziraphale is really not that good of a liar. He tried to lie to angels when they came to his bookshop in episode 2, but he really was struggling and he definitely wouldn't be able to lie to Crowley. Crowley knows him better than anyone he would know immediately. Their final scene just doesn't make sense with this theory in mind. Another proof for this theory that I've seen is that the Nightingale song starts playing when Crowley enters the Bentley. So people are asking why would it play? Uh, that's literally the last song that Crowley would want to hear at that moment and the Bentley doesn't play any other songs except Queen. The only time it played anything else than Queen was when Aziraphale was in it. And that's why some people suggest that it's Aziraphale is doing and that he's sending some sort of a message to Crowley. A sort of, no my dear, I have not departed. Nightingales shall play for us again once I return. At first I did find it weird, but then I was editing my last video and I watched the bookshop burning scene again and I realized the Bentley is just really tone deaf. When Crowley is driving towards the bookshop, he's absolutely horrified. He's trying to reach Aziraphale, terrified for his safety. The Bentley starts playing You're My Best Friend by Queen. The song that is literally just You are the reason why I'm alive. I love you more than anything. You are my dearest friend. And then when Crowley comes out of the bookshop thinking Aziraphale is dead, his only companion in this world, the only man that could help him at this moment. The fucking Bentley starts playing somebody to love. It's always been super insensitive. That car is kind of a dig actually. So yeah, I don't think Aziraphale is sending any secret messages to Crowley, nor was he pressured into taking the job. Switch theory. It's kind of like lie theory, but with extra steps. So the basics of this theory are yes, Metatron threatens Aziraphale. But, instead of lying to Crowley and going to heaven, he goes back into the bookshop, tells Crowley everything and they make a plan. We don't know what that plan is yet, because we'll see it in season 3, but what it involves is kissing and switching bodies. Why do they have to kiss now when they could have switched their bodies by shaking hands like they did last time? I don't know. Why do they need to act out that entire scene? I don't know. 
because if Metatron was listening in, then they couldn't have made the plan anyways. What is used as a proof for this theory is that there is a clock behind them and while they're kissing, 15 minutes pass. So people are asking what happened in those 15 minutes. I don't know if they like kissed, made the plan and then kissed again and it was cut to be one kiss or if they just kissed for 15 minutes straight and made the plan while at it. But since then this theory has been actually debunked because someone asked Neil Gaiman on Tumblr if those 15 minutes were intentional and he obviously said no. Imagine kissing someone like that for 15 minutes. They look like two coconuts smashing against each other. No wonder he looked at Crowley like that. My man was being held hostage. <laughs> I do the same in his shoes. Also, Crowley isn't that great of an actor. He can't really act like a zero fail. Like the last time he tried that, he just stared at everyone. And yeah, he fooled them, but that was because he was there for like five minutes and then left. So yeah, I think they'd get found out pretty early on. <laughs> This theory is very different from all the theories that I've talked about before, so I'll let future me handle this one. Take it away, future me! So I've said before that this theory is a little bit different from the rest of the theories, and by a little bit I mean a lot, because while you can find most of the other theories in like small posts on Tumblr and TikTok and whatever, this theory can be found on a 36 page long Google document. I wish I was joking. Yeah, it's it's a lot. I went through this entire theory with my friend and because we weren't able to call and even if we were that would literally be like 24 hour long call. We decided that we would copy the document and then leave notes on it so that both of us can comment whenever we want and highlight whatever section we are talking about. So by the time I'm recording this, uh, we are on page... Fucking Christ, still scrolling. Uh, we are on page... What fucking page is this? We are on page 29 of 36, but I've read the entire thing by now, so sometimes I'm going to just read the notes that we left on this document, and sometimes I'm just going to ramble without any notes. You may be asking, what fucking day is it? Why is it suddenly dark? Why do you have different clothes? And the answer is it's been like four days since I finished recording the first part because this theory is just so complicated and convoluted and just so much to go through that I really did not have the mood for it a few days ago. And to be honest, I don't have the mood for it now either. Uh, but I feel like I don't have a choice. I have a lot to say about this theory. I will probably be very critical most of the time. I don't want that to seem that I don't like the author or that I feel that the writing is bad or anything. It's really nicely written. I just find most of the proof reaching and just taken out of context and I don't know, I just wanted to talk about it. So don't be mean to the author, don't send them hate or anything. Uh, they can think whatever they want to think. If they believe this, then wow, great for them. Let's agree to disagree and who knows, maybe they're right, we'll see in season 3. I finished editing the entire video except this section, so yeah, I, I, I need to start. <laughs> so it's called The Magic Trick You Didn't See, Being an Analysis of Good Omen Season 2. Or Neil Gaiman, your brain is gorgeous, but I have cracked your sneaky little coat and have you dead to rights, maybe. Before we start, I'm just going to tell you the premise of this theory so that you can think about it while I talk. It's about Metatron rewriting the Book of Life as the entire season goes. Most of the events that happen are just written by Metatron. I hope you can see already what's wrong with this theory, but I'll talk about it as we go. So it starts with the proem. Proem? Pro something, I don't care. The rustling of the audience, close breathing whispers of anticipation, the lights come up, a man enters stage left. He is a magician, a master magician, and he performs for you a magic trick so good and subtle that you don't even notice you've seen it. You know there must have been a trick. After all, you came to the theater to see a trick performed, didn't you? And he claims to be a magician. So there had to be a trick somewhere. There had to be. Maybe there wasn't. Maybe there was just a man on stage, talking to you, telling you a story with a strangely unsatisfying ending you didn't quite understand. The author kind of keeps talking about how Neil Gaiman's writing is really bad, uh, but disguising it with, oh, it's Metatron's writing being bad. And I don't see this theory working, so I just feel like it's calling Neil Gaiman's writing bad. And this will be like a theme throughout this entire theory. It will just keep coming back about how many mistakes Metatron is writing 
and then it's not even like writing mistake it's just a scene they didn't like then they have this list of things that they saw as odd i find all these things normal i don't really see them as odd i think people lots of times forget that good omens is insane like just remember fucking season one it had aliens for like five seconds satan showed up there are witch hunters the entire premise is two ethereal beings trying to stop the armageddon from 11 year old antichrist like it's supposed to be insane that's literally the fun of it so then they talk about shit like the zombies where are they well we don't know, we don't need to know. Where are the aliens? The whole long sequence of buying bullet catch trick and putting it on the show. Why did we need to see all that? Because that's a fun scene. Like, I like to see that. What's the fucking point of them looking at Noah's Ark, you know? It's just scenes that give them depth as characters. The statue of Gabriel. What's going on with it? It keeps coming up as a thing, but why? Because it's really fucking funny. That man literally keeps coming to the fucking statue to stare at it. And Crowley jokes about it like, oh, I'm pretty sure he does that. And then he does that and even brings his partner to see it. How fucking funny is that? Aziraphale not taking anything with him from the bookshop when he leaves, not even his journals. After all that discussion in season 1 about the thing you can get in heaven that he would miss so much, he's willing to sabotage the apocalypse. It's completely different situation. Now that he's going to heaven, the world is still going to be there. He still can go grab sushi. And he also cares about the world's well-being more than his own self. Like he sacrifices his happiness to go make the world better. Metatron has access to the book of life and he was editing it the whole time. I'll give you a moment to sit with that and think about it. No thanks. I'm not going to talk about every single thing because we literally just started. Uh, we are on we are on page 14 and this recording is already half an hour long. So I'm just going to skip through this a lot. First they start with the thing that God doesn't narrate this season anymore. Uh, so that must mean that the storyteller is different. But that was just debunked. Neil Gaiman confirmed that God isn't narrating season 2 because they aren't needed anymore. Because the only reason God was in season 1 was so that the transition between book and series would be better. They tried to get a couple coffee shop AU lesbians to make out. They had a little kid fig moment with Amnesia Gabriel. Jesus Christ, Neil, how many fanfic tropes are you stuffing into this clown car? Ugh. They just... I, I feel like that... They just really didn't like the writing of season 2 and they made this entire theory to just justify not liking it. Like, yeah, season 2 is different from the original Good Omens, but I don't think that's a bad thing inherently. Then they talk about their first meeting back before Earth was created and they say that that was also rewritten so that Crowley and Aziraphale wouldn't get too close to each other. It would make sense to me if this was a memory that Metatron just completely added in. Hey, your first impression of this guy wasn't generally positive. He was so cute and you really liked him, but then he started asking questions and you, you're so smart, saw that he was presumptuous and wanted to question God's plan and suggested the suggestion box and you told him off for it. Aren't you good? Also, you remember when he said, look at you, you're gorgeous, and you thought he was talking to you, but he wasn't? Felt like a small rejection, right? Well, you were being a little bit of cringe. Of course he wouldn't think or say that about you. Those overdramatic music cues only seem to happen in bits where I think Metatron is meddling because he's subtle, he's not that good of a writer, just a little bit too heavy-handed. So yeah, they keep talking about how Metatron is rewriting their memories. If Metatron would be able to do that, to rewrite the entire book, why would he fucking bother with this? Why wasn't he just fucking delete them? They weren't that important in history. They could have been easily, easily replaced. There are several points enough for it to seem like a pattern where characters decline alcohol or implicitly frame it as an immoral thing. <laughs> I strongly feel that the pattern this indicates is that Metatron disproves of alcohol and is editing Aziraphale's memories to take it out. <laughs> Can you see what I mean? Why the fuck would he do this? I don't like alcohol, so neither can you. Like, no! No, he doesn't give enough of a fuck. Why would he? That's just so much work. Like, 
what is this fanboy ass motherfucker? He's somewhere in heaven just rewriting the entire history just because he doesn't like alcohol. Episode 2, in the job memory, Crowley attempts to offer Zirfell wine. Aziraphale declines and makes icky faces about it. However, also in episode 2, when C and A, Crowley and Aziraphale, go to the pub in present day, Aziraphale orders a sherry, very much in character with what we know of him, and Crowley makes a little joke about it. So what the fuck is this point? <laughs> Literally, oh, Aziraphale still orders alcohol. He's allowed to order alcohol. Yes, then your theory is wrong. Episode 3, when Dalrymple offers them drinks, we see Aziraphale sniffing in his and making a little face. A few moments later, he sets his cup aside entirely. I wrote here, OP would love to drink whiskey that was given to them by a guy that never washed his hands after working with literal corpses. Then they talk about how uh, Crowley and Aziraphale share uh, wine in 1941, and that that has to be an oversight by Metatron because that isn't rewritten and they're allowed to drink alcohol so that means that Metatron didn't see that, no, then your theory doesn't make sense. If there are these weird ass exceptions then that disproves your point. And one more thing at the beginning of the scene, Aziraphale offers to repay the nice thing Crowley did. Honestly sounding kind of sultry here, are you trying to flirt, baby girl, are you feeling a little bit horned because the noodle demon saved your books for you? A bit hot and bothered, come on, you can tell me. It's always, oh, respect asexual people, respect asexuality, unless it's the two gay male presenting characters that you want to see fucking. They don't feel stuff like that. I know that this is an unpopular opinion, but I don't, I don't care. Did Metatron kill God to get Book of Life? Then there's this entire section of Maggie being a fictional character, like Metatron made her up. There are so many weird little clues to support this theory and they are so subtle because a lot of them are in the genre of clumsy apprentice writer mistake. The note that she leaves in Aziraphale's mail slot has a misspelling on it, urgency instead of urgency. Yes, Neil Gaiman confirmed that she just misspelled it. She has dramatic shifts in mood. Yeah, but yeah, that's because she's kind of a mess. She loves Nina, there's so many things happening. She keeps kind of switching back and forth with emotions. And that's normal, it wasn't really unusual. Maggie doesn't drink, oh wow, now everyone that doesn't drink is a made-up fictional character. Okay, this is the part that made me the most angry. And probably is the part that I'll be ending this one on. Uh, there is like fucking there are ten more pages uh, But I just feel like I've proved my point by now This part is called you could be my second in command. They talk about how it's weird that Zirfell said that He literally just meant that as in oh, I was offered the job But I need you by my side even when I'm there. I can't go there without you It wasn't like oh, I, I can be the boss and you can be a little the dumb bitch by my side like no And then they talk about Zirafel as a character and they get it just so fucking wrong That uh, I'm just going to read this entire section without interrupting this thread also intersects with the line We can be together as angels doing good because okay But like since when has Zirafel's primary motivation has ever been to do good? Aziraphale is here to vibe and have a nice time and be comfy. He gave his flaming sword to Adam and Eve because, and I quote, there are vicious animals, it's going to be cold out there and she's suspecting already. He recognized that they were going to be severely uncomfy and that was viscerally horrifying to him and his empathy. Also, I bet that sword was heavy and he was tired of holding it anyway, so other than the guilt about heaven being mad at him, giving it away was kind of a win-win. We love and cherish one lazy bitch. He does good when he's supposed to do good because it's his job to do good. But does he do good in his free time? No. His free time is spent going to lunch with Crowley, going to the theater with Crowley and running where he works very hard to avoid selling people books and gets very hostile when people insist on trying. His entire reason for stopping the end of the world in season was was because it would personally inconvenience him and get in his ways of his lavish lunch dates with his bestie. And I think this is the main reason why uh, this person didn't understand the entire season. Uh, because they don't really understand the characters. Um, like, of course you'll think that the entire season is really bad writing, 
uh, when you think that every single thing the character does doesn't fit with their personality. They just so completely misunderstood Zerfel as a character. Like, does he do selfish things too? Yes, but he would absolutely sacrifice everything to help people. He loves everyone. He risks multiple times his own safety and well-being for people and for everyone, for Crowley. And even in the end, after heaven hurt him so much, he still loves them because he's just that kind of a person. So how can you say that he does good things? only when he feels empathy towards those people. The problem with this theory is that the person that wrote it thinks that Crowley is really good, unselfish, purely morally righteous character, while Aziraphale is, is a little bit selfish, comfortable, lazy fuck. The point right after that one is, in short, he could have been playing politics and doing good if he had the interest. He does not have the interest. He wants to do less work, not more. He wants more time for his hobbies, and hanging out with Crowley. But that's the fucking thing, he can't do any more good than he does. Because the entire point of Earth is to test people. He can join the politics, he can start the revolution, he can really do anything that important. Because it's the human's job, he can help people in a significant way. So he's trying to do as much good as possible with these little miracles and with little acts. So yeah, that's it for this theory. I didn't even go through half of this fucking document. There are so many things and I recommend you read it. I mean, it's, it's really well written if and nothing else. You can really see that the author is like a published author. It's you can read it very nicely. Of course, I mean, no hate towards the author. It's totally harmless. And I mean, if they see it like this, then yeah, sure, do whatever. So yeah, go read this theory for yourself. Uh, go check the author out. Uh, I will link it in description. And uh, yeah, make your own opinion on this. Uh, I think you can feel how I feel about this theory. So I would rather you'd read it for yourself and decide what you think about it. That's it. We are finally done. You can put away your tinfoil hats. We are done. I'm actually pretty sure this video is cursed because I've tried recording this video for five times already. And every single time I've got to the end of the video, I found out that there is something wrong with the fucking footage. So right now I literally have like seven hours of footage on my phone. I swear to God, if there's something wrong with this, I won't re-record this again. I'm quitting YouTube if that happens. Anyways, I wanted to talk about one more theory and that was the Lucifer theory. We just talked about how Crowley could be Lucifer. Uh, but since then that has been debunked because it was found out that Satan is the same person as Lucifer. Neil Gaiman confirmed that on Tumblr. And it also didn't fit the theme of this video where I only talked about the finale theory. So yes, that's it for this video. It was really fun talking about these theories, but I just think there are too many holes in them for them to come true in season 3. If you found any of these theories interesting, then go make further research on them. I didn't talk about every single evidence that I found because this video would be so long and I don't care enough. The finale had to happen. What Crowley and Aziraphale did was in character for both of them. Crowley loves running away. He does this multiple times throughout the show. He thinks on spot. He doesn't really think too much into the future. That's why he'd rather run away than solve his problems. Because he doesn't care where he'll be. He just cares if he'll be there with Aziraphale. But Aziraphale can't keep running away. He's just not that kind of person. He likes to get comfortable at one space and he can't keep avoiding his problems. That's why he'd never be comfortable if he ran away with Crowley. It would bother him too much that he left everything behind. That's why he chose to go to heaven, because he thinks he can solve everything. And that when he fixes heaven, he'll be able to live with Crowley without anyone bothering them. The finale is very complicated, but very powerful. That's why I don't really like these theories, because it kind of takes away that punch. I think it's time to accept that Aziraphale's and Crowley's relationship wasn't perfect, and that this needed to happen for them to develop as people. So yes, that's it from me for today.
If you like this video, then feel free to subscribe. I will continue doing fandom videos like this. I know I've said that I would do a season 2 analysis, but I've realized that would be too much effort and that it would take me literally years to finish that. So I've decided that in the next video, I will only talk about the second episode of season 2 because it's my favorite and I have so many thoughts about it. But that probably won't come out for a long time. So if you want to hear more from me, then follow me on Tumblr. I post some thoughts and mediocre art and you you can also talk to me there. Thank you for watching this video, it means so much to me and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye bye. He seems nice.